to smoke heavy heart. Oh, Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tech Talk Travel. Today I've got a, a great guest with us, Richard Volta from Muse. Hi there. Richard, welcome to the show. It's great Thanks to have you on board. Yeah, Thank, no. you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the invite. Wonderful. So, Richard, let's start a little bit about your with your background. Um, you come from a hotelier background. I think you grew up in hotels or yep. with hotels. Yep. You've worked in the industry. Again, like many of us. So I'd like to hear maybe start with some of your personal stories um, and how you uh, transitioned from that into where you are today. Yeah, I... Um I think the, the the main reason why I, I thought to actually innovate anything in the hotel industry was uh, through my memories of always coming back from my summer holidays and having to be a uh, night receptionist. Uh, while everyone else was kind of having fun on their summer holidays, I basically did the uh, the graveyard shift from seven to seven, and uh, I just remember having to do so many different things with a night audit um, and just how boring the whole experience basically was. Uh, you basically had about three hours of action, like when people were coming in, basically they were they were a little bit kind of more relaxed, they weren't just kind of checking in, so you could actually have a conversation with them. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed that part of, um, I guess, being a receptionist and, and doing uh, doing those kind of tasks. And I always have that basically in the back of my mind. That, that that was the enjoyable part, and then all of the system stuff was just was painful. Like it was two hours of, of doing so many different kind of tasks and things, and, and having to use kind of um, you know Excel, and then basically like also having to use the systems, kind of putting all of that together, checking about fifteen different things. It just I don't know. I think after a certain while, it was just thinking. Like, why is this so complicated? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that was one of the, the kind of earliest drivers for um, you know, why why things needed to be automated. Mm -hmm. so, so that was really perhaps one of your main motivators. Yeah, yeah. Like I yeah. still have that in the in the back of my mind whenever we're thinking yeah. about a feature. Yeah. Um, I'm always thinking about like how can we make sure that the person behind the reception desk doesn't have to do any of that kind of data entry. He doesn't have to do any of those kind of checks mm. um, that should really all be kind of automated mm. I think it then kind of travels up to management because um, I think you, you do still want people to kind of be be kind of auditing but you should have them as kind of auditors and not data entry people I think there's no humanity in data entry so. Exactly. And was it purely the night auditing side that you were working on, or did you also spend time uh, during the day and, and using the systems as well? Yeah, yeah. Like, sure so did, so. I mean, like, I always knew that part, and I, and, I, <clears throat> and that was that came a little bit later on. But I think, yeah. in terms of like truly vivid memories of me being a 15-year-old, basically, and um, like I think those kinds of things are really imprinted on you. Mm. Uh, and I think you know the because the the. The further up the food chain you get, the more it just gets into kind of reports and running reports and looking at reports and analysing things and, and that's almost kind of a little bit more difficult to kind of think about how much time you're wasting basically by doing that because you're more or less just thinking that this is actually part of my job and this is the analytical part basically, these are the reports that I want to look at and so you don't really tend to think of that in terms of the time but you do tend to think of it in terms of the time if it's something that's preventing you from doing the job that you think you should be actually doing and that's why if you're thinking like a receptionist I think that's where you get the kind of the purest um, split between you know how much time you're you're wasting in your systems versus the work that you think you should be doing which is you know communicating with the guests and, and having that kind of um, uh, having that kind of experience of hospitality, I guess. In a way. So, I, uh, we, you, we were just talking before we started the interview, and you've also, I've heard you say also before in the past, the the, the, the hotel operator perhaps of today needs to be a little bit, maybe a little bit more progressive in their thinking and, and try to come out of that old school uh, mentality when it comes to the way we do things yeah. generally, not just with technology, but perhaps as a whole within the industry. Um, are you seeing, from your perspective, that that is starting to happen, it, especially with, with um, perhaps the more established um, hoteliers? Is it something that they're transitioning through, or are they struggling with it? Is it? I think it's more that the... I'd actually kind of say that the, the, the guys that we've been fortunate enough to work with um, in our kind of... in our journey, <coughs> 
they've all been really forward-thinking hoteliers and they've been guys who have seen that there is a need for change within the way that they approach systems, the way that they approach um, the, uh, you know, their own revenue generating aspect, the way that they approach service and how that can actually kind of, um, you know, not just stay static, but how you can actually develop um, these kinds of relationships with, with customers and then use the, the power of technology to basically maximize that to its full effect and kind of amplify that. And I think what we're seeing more is basically that the kind of the, the generation of uh, hoteliers, and that, that isn't actually a kind of age generation, it's more of a mindset generation. Of, um, but it's the, the generation of hoteliers that kind of are used to kind of sitting back and waiting for things to kind of happen to them. That's basically being pushed out by the more proactive and aggressive hoteliers. Um, and I think what, what we're seeing there is that a lot of those people then take us with them, with, uh, with that kind of journey. Because I think one of the things that uh, we always kind of end up struggle, uh, struggling with to, to kind of to, to prove to people and to actually kind of show people is just how much automation can actually kind of save you. Because it's, it's again going into those kind of reports. If you're running reports your entire day and you're kind of like sifting through um, optimizations and things like that, Sometimes all of that plus the emails can just take up your day and you kind of think that that's actually a normal way of, of working. Sometimes you have more work, sometimes you have less work. Um, but I think it's quite difficult to kind of take a step back and think, how can I do this in the optimal way, in the most efficient way? Mm. Um, and I think that's where people kind of, um, a lot of the times, don't really see the, almost the, the point of technology in being able to make that super super simple for you and being able to actually then just um, think about you know what is the strategy that I want to go with rather than what are the actual individual tasks that I want to do or that I have to do on this particular day yeah. and I think that that mind shift change of, of getting technology to kind of work for you um, and kind of almost expecting technology providers to actually give you that. Um, I think that, that that's still permeating through the industry, but I think that that's the biggest kind of mind shift change. Do you see that the actual technology providers such as yourselves have a certain responsibility to make that, to, to try to bring that shift as well and to bring that change? Yeah, like I think, um, I, I think we were just saying earlier, um, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because we feel that responsibility and I think you know, everyone at News feels that doubly so because we're all ex-hoteliers and so we all you know want to kind of really help the industry in some ways we want to kind of make sure that we're doing things or whether we're helping the industry in itself um, but I think by taking on that responsibility you end up um, you know essentially getting those kind of things you know, thrown back at you and it's a good process you know because you know, it means that if we're if we're not good enough, basically, or if we're not delivering the service that we're kind of setting ourselves to uh, to do, then you know it's it's actually perfectly reasonable for somebody to say, like, look, you guys kind of came in with a promise that this will all be better, this will be much smoother, and you know we'll we'll operate in a much better way. And you're not living up to that uh, mm. to that promise, and then we're like, crap, okay, yes, we absolutely have to kind of get better. We have to make sure that we're optimizing this, optimizing that. And, uh, but then it always kind of hits me and I always kind of think like, well, where was this passion? Where was this kind of like, uh, where was, you know, where, where was that before when you had your old system? Were you pushing your providers in the same kind of way? And I, I think for that, like, it is good. It is good that that's actually the natural relationship that everyone should have to their technology provider. You shouldn't just kind of take a step back and kind of say, well, this is how they are, this is how they run the business, and I can't pick up the phone and speak to the founder or the CEO or you know whoever to kind of like try and fix things. Um, I think that's what's always uh, what, what we want to kind of make sure that basically still is that you can maintain that. Yeah, <clears throat> but it's a good. I mean, it's an interesting point because as a company like yourselves now, with the growth that you're seeing. You, you want to grow the company even further and you want to expand to bigger markets 
and obviously to change as well. So yeah. as that growth comes, how do you see Muse maintaining that type of culture, that philosophy, so that you can have that connection with the customer? Like, I, I think, I don't know, like, I think there's enough cases where we've seen that that's possible. And, like, I can use even a kind of personal uh, analogy, like, so, for example, I've always had that to Apple products. I think when um, you know there, there was something comforting about you know Apple bringing out a new feature and people just just bitching about it to uh, to Steve Jobs basically, and you know and him going like, "Well, turn it that way" or whatever his line was, you know, or you're looking at it wrong. Um, but I think like the thing that gets lost in that story is that you know that the person felt such a strong attachment to the brand they felt it was okay to basically just go, you know, Steve Jobs at Apple.com and send that email. And I had the same thing, like we were working on something um, with Apple a couple of years back and, uh, you know, we were doing it through one of their kind of regional uh, centers and I basically thought it screwed. So I typed an email to Phil Schiller, the head of, um, the head of marketing there, and within a day he forwarded it to the right person. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and you know, things basically started moving. And I think that's, that to me is, that's how technology companies should be. You know, you should really always know the people behind them. You should know that you can get somewhere, that, that it's not some kind of, you know, war that you're a bureaucracy that you have to kind of get through because, you know, it's like, oh, I have to speak to my line manager. I have to go and, I think like it, it puts a lot more pressure on the likes of us, but that's good pressure. That's yeah. essentially how it's Also, perhaps a lot more expectation as well. Yeah. yeah. But as you say, that's a good thing. But like, definitely. in the end, it's a good thing. It's yeah. like, it's a terrible thing while you're going through it, and it's a terrible thing to kind of, you know, yeah. have to fess up and say sorry yeah. to the customer, you know, sorry that I've let you down, or mm. that mm. You, it's not as good as you were expecting, or that, mm. you know, that we'll strive to do better. But I think just, the openness of being kind of okay with that uh, as a tech company, I think that that's something that we kind of really strive for. Mm, good, good. Um, just staying on the chains a little bit, I'd like to try to get your understanding of how a company such as yourselves could position yourselves maybe so that if a Hilton or an IHG or a Marriott decided eventually to to really do, do replace their existing PMS infrastructure, which for the predominantly is, is all local based infrastructure, yeah. and they wanted to lift it off property and bring it into the cloud. Um, that in itself for them is a huge challenge. It's a big deal and there's many various factors that, that they need to consider. How, how are ways that companies like yourselves or other PMS companies, that they can try to take that pressure off the, the chain so that there's almost like an encouraging way to say, okay guys, look, we, we've come up with this option for yeah. you. Maybe it's just, we can sit down and go through it and see if it's something that would be suitable for yeah, you. Like I, I, I think we kind of touched upon it a little bit when we were talking earlier, but I think there's, there's two aspects of this. I think one is the interoperability of data yeah. and the, the idea that as a, uh, as a data controller, as the hotel, you should be able to just take your data Put it anywhere else and i think the easier that that becomes and the easier that you're able to kind of get data out of silos um it's gonna it's gonna make life so much easier for a hotelier to basically just say well you know what even though i've got all of this data sitting in this silo and i'm really really worried about what happens when i switch um the, the fact that there will be tools out there and that technology providers such as us, but also some of the great guys that are, that are doing this kind of service in the industry, the better job that they do, I think that the easier it will be for companies, um, you know, no matter how small or no matter how large, uh, for them to actually have, have faith that their data will somehow not disappear. Mm. I think the second thing that's, uh, that's happening as a kind of major trend is the fact that um, most of the regulation is kind of moving with the times, even if the, the vendors are not, basically. And I think um, you know, something that I, I really, really think will actually force pretty much every single hotelier into the cloud is, for example, things like GDPR. I think, you know, I, if I really look at that law and I, if I really look at how 
if it's enforced, which we can never kind of know, but if it's enforced, which I generally kind of think that it, that it probably will be, um, there's no way that you can have a server-based, uh, a local no. server-based product and still be compliant within GDPR. And I think, yeah, I think that that's, that's one thing that's kind of, um, uh, that will force a, a shift. Uh, but I think then it basically also comes to um, you know, all of the local regulation. I think you know, in some countries within Europe, we now have a direct link up with the Ministry of Finance because that's what the country's laws dictate to us. And I think more and more that you're seeing kind of government and, and that kind of that aspect becoming digitized. Um, I think there, there you'll see basically that, that um, a lot of the systems, A, will have to be cloud, but B, they'll have to be localized in a, in a way that hasn't been seen before, basically. Um, and I think that's that's going to be a huge challenge for the chains to be able to still have compliance worldwide. Mm. And I think that'll drive a lot of kind of managerial autonomy to um, uh, to some of the kind of subparts to basically be able to start working with perhaps different systems. And again, that's where the interoperability of data comes in mm. uh, to basically make sure that, that you still feel that basically you can still actually navigate through that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I think those are the two biggest kind of challenges uh, facing the uh, the hotel industry mm -hmm. today. And yeah. uh, I think another factor that a lot of the chains think about as well is obviously the security of data. Um, you know, the, the, the volume that they have to handle yeah. and manage is huge, and securing that is a huge responsibility. Yeah, like, and I think, like, um, because it, it comes down to everything, I think, you know, just the idea of actually getting a report, mm. uh, extracting a report, like that's technically a data leak, you know? And um, I, think, I think generally the, the chains kind of know about this. Um, I'm not sure that they have a, um, a foolproof way of kind of being able to, to, to control that. Mm. Um, but I think, in general, it is it is going to be basically something that um, is a big kind of uh, issue, and I, I think there there will like we're we're only at the kind of the uh, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you when you think about how systems have up until now uh, stored personal data, uh, I mean, like we were super lucky in a way that we created. PMS as a CRM because we just thought that like the most important data is the customer data. You shouldn't really care about rooms because room inventory should be a kind of malleable thing. Yeah. You know, if you want to add another couple of houses or a couple of um, rooms to an already existing, that should be completely normal in the future. Um, and I think that that's basically that was one thing that we just did it because we thought that, that was kind of normal. Um, and now we're actually seeing some kind of like, let's say like regulatory payback for thinking in this kind of way. But I think for the wider industry, it is going to be a kind of, uh, it is going to be a problem. And I think, you know, the, the, the PMS, I mean, it does so much already and that's why it's such a complicated piece of technology. Um, but I think it does need to kind of think like a CRM in order to, I think, comply with the, with the data laws. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, just talking a little bit about the companies like Trivago and Booking and Expedia. Um, I was talking with um, Trivago, with Johannes from Trivago the other, the other day, and um, we spoke a bit about their purchase of Base 7 Booking. Mm -hmm and how that's becoming for them a, a real part of their strategy moving forward to their market. Do you see, with companies like Booking and Expedia now also having B2B solutions, do you think that from their perspective it would make commercial sense to bring in a, a PMS as well into that solution, into their portfolio and, and to offer that out? And, and if so, do you see that there would be um, perhaps a, a, it's an, almost a bit of a conflict in that sense that they're trying to capture so much in, in like how do you what how would you see that because from i think from a logical perspective yeah. it would make sense yeah like i i, I think it's I, I think those guys are much more clued up about how much of the um of the funnel you want to control and i think with the pms basically at the end of it like you're the one controlling the inventory data so if anyone's really going to kind of disrupt um uh, the 
even the, the way that uh, the companies or the, um, you're able to kind of sell the rooms. I mean, like, that's basically going to be the guys who are controlling the inventory, which is basically the hotelier themselves. The, the, the hoteliers still have the most amount of power in the industry. Yeah. It's just they decide to kind of give it away periodically because they they can't really be bothered to do the kind of the lead generation themselves and the, so they essentially just do it for a price of 18 to 30 percent or 15 to, to 30 percent and that, that like that seems to be kind of like fine and that's like a trade-off that, that most hoteliers seem to be kind of okay with I'm not sure how much of a conscious decision that is for most hoteliers but they're kind of okay with it so I think if I'm an OTA, I'm going to be thinking, well, if they're okay to do that, why wouldn't they take a B2B product from me? As long as, you know, I think that, for example, the biggest thing why people hate Booking.com, um, I think most of the time is just because of the fact that Booking.com does such a good job of making money for the hotel. And so you hate handing over the check. But if you didn't have to hand in that, over that check and you had that relationship kind of almost reversed, I think people would be kind of okay with it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, you know, for, for people like us that really do care about the kind of the, the hotelier viewpoint and kind of say like, it should be, we should be creating the tools to make the hotelier kind of, you know, strong and, and feel powerful basically. And, and that's what we think technology partners that are working for the hoteliers, that's what they should be doing. Um, but, you know, if we're ultimately defeated by, let's say, the, the hoteliers kind of saying, well, actually, I don't mind doing all of this and ceding away that power again for the, for the fact that I don't really have to do anything and it only comes at a cost of 18%, ultimately, I'll, 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 I'd understand why. I think it's a shame and I think it's a shame for the entire industry. Um, but I can understand why that would basically happen. So I can understand why Booking would be looking into this. I'd understand why Expedia, either through Tra Travago or in collaboration with them, uh, would be doing that. But um, It's certainly going to be an interesting space to watch, isn't it, in the next, I think, few years. Anyway. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Because as you said, the PMS really is the pivotal point. It's where yeah. all of the, the data is for, from the hotel site. And they, the hotelier has the power in it. Yeah. So, so that's very interesting. Okay, we're, we're, we are out of time. One final question, if I may. Um, what advice would you give to a student coming out of school, hotel school, and wanting to perhaps work in, in, in the technology side of the industry as opposed to the operational side? What, what, what factors, because when they go through their schooling, they're very much taught on the operational side yeah, of things, yeah. but there's a lot of them that are actually drawn to the technology because it's a changing scope in, the, in, in our, in our uh, industry and it's also a bit exciting. So how would you, what advice would you give to a young student coming out with um, one technology? I think the, the best way, because hoteliers have a tendency to try and be everything to everyone, so when whenever you see kind of startups uh, as well kind of emerge, they start out with huge plans basically. Um, and then sometimes they scale back to something a little bit more kind of achievable, um, but they think about it from the point of view of how can I overhaul everything? Um, and I think the, the really truly successful cases that I think you've seen in the industry so far is when people are able to like really zero in on one particular problem and really kind of go after that. And I think, you know, if you think about kind of companies like Hotel Champ or, um, or uh, Triptease, I think they, they've been really, really good at just solving, you know, let's say minor issues, but that basically like matter to hoteliers and, and the guys behind those companies have really built up amazing companies basically doing that. So I think it's, it's also something that, you know, we try and really promote uh, through having these kind of open APIs and building up this kind of developer community because that should be the normal thing. It should be, you know, a lot of companies doing one particular thing incredibly well. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that's probably my advice is that, you know, like, fine, you can always build up a massive company a little bit later, but focus primarily on what is that one thing yeah. that you really, really think can actually help yeah. the most amount of hoteliers. Good advice.
very good advice. So, Richard, thank you very much. It's been great having you on the show, and uh, we'll see you around no doubt. Uh, if you enjoyed that, please make sure you subscribe, and when you subscribe, hit the little bell next to the subscribe button so that you get notifications. And until then, we'll see you next time. Right. Thanks, Richard. That's Thank great. You. Cheers. Thanks a so lot. Be the death of me, but I take a chance, girl, preferably. Better play the game if you have for me, then let's flex. Yeah.